Welcome everyone. My name is Jerry Hajar and uh, I'm the department chair in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Northeastern University. Thank you all for joining us for today's panel discussion. Uh, this is the third in a series of three panel discussions featuring civil and environmental engineering faculty and members of our industrial advisory board and discussions around topics related to civil and environmental engineering solutions addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Much of the work that we do in our department has been focused on urban engineering, looking at, a new, uh, new, looking at new solutions for complex urban regions. And soon after the pandemic started, many of our faculty, about half the department, quickly started addressing some of the most pressing issues facing us in this pandemic including, for example, developing new test protocols to detect the virus, testing materials to develop effective masks, addressing patterns of spreading of the virus, looking at the impact of the pandemic on pollution, looking at the impact on our transportation systems and urban mobility. Uh, please see our website at cee.northeastern.edu for more information on our research and education programs. Members of our Industrial Advisory Board have also been addressing issues of the pandemic and together we're very happy to present these panel discussions. Today's topic is environmental health uh, in a pandemic. Before I introduce today's moderator, I'd like to mention a couple of logistical details. Uh, as a note to everyone, this event is being recorded. Also, we ask everyone in the audience to please keep your microphones and your video off for better streaming quality. Uh, and there will be a question and answer session after the presentations and all questions that you have can be put into the chat. Now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, uh, Heather Ford, and then she will introduce today's panel. Uh, Heather Ford is a proud civil engineering alumna of our program and a member of our industrial advisory board. She's the managing director of STEM learning and development at global training and events at the global training and events group. Prior to this, over her 40 year career, uh, she led large scale environmental engineering projects for a range of clients. Uh, Ms. Ford has been active in local politics, including serving on uh, board of selectmen, Board of Public Works and currently chairing uh, the Capital Committee. She's currently serving a second term as a legislative fellow for the Boston Society of Civil Engineers. And in 2019, uh, Heather Ford received the Outstanding Civil Engineering Alumni Award from our department. Heather, great to have you here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Hagadar. Um, I am thrilled to be here today to moderate this important topic on environmental health in a pandemic, so welcome all. As health has been top of mind for all of us over the past six months, primarily our own personal health, now as we think about emerging from homes, consider going back to the office, the next focus is on health of our environment, both in the office buildings and the infrastructure to get to that office, as well as the wider world of the environment. Uh, today's timely, very timely panel will focus on the health impacts to office workers the wider, and the wider impacts to our environment. As civil engineers, we know how to manage water, create infrastructure, but now we are being asked to solve problems in a totally new way. Buildings have been left stagnant for months, but now they have to be evaluated to determine if they are safe. Sewage entering treatment plants with discharges to water bodies have impacts from viruses. How are these handled and what are we learning? Luckily, we have some wonderful members of our Northeastern community here to present perspectives on this topic. We have Northeastern alumni who are facing real world issues as we reopen our economy and some very interesting research going on here at Northeastern to provide solutions. Our first panelist this morning or this afternoon is William Howard. Bill is a proud civil engineering alumnus currently serving in two positions. One as the president of FIDIC, which is the International Federation of Consulting Engineers, and the second as the strategic advisor to the leadership team for the engineering consulting firm of CD, CDM Smith. Bill is a member of the Northeastern Board of Trustees, chairing the audit committee, 
and he's on the Civil Engineering Industrial Advisory Board. In 2017, he was named Northeastern's Outstanding Civil Engineering Alumnus. Bill? Thank you very much, Heather, and um, thanks everyone for participating um, in this webinar. I'm gonna to speak to you today about uh, some of the highlights of, eight, of 18 webinars that FIDIC actually put on over the last couple of months, all dealing with the pandemic. So a lot of it is general in nature and kind of at the, at the strategic level. Uh, we had over 9,000 participants in the webinars uh, from 150 countries. So there's a lot of uh, information uh, gathered from all over the world. We had 75 executive level speakers from all elements of the infrastructure environment, plus professional organizations and the international funding institutions such as the World Bank. So we got a lot of uh, broad views. All of the sessions were recorded and you can see on the screen a link to, uh, to YouTube. So those of you who would like to listen in on on what was discussed in all those webinars or any of them, uh, you're certainly welcome to and I'd recommend it. The following uh, are a few of the key findings from the webinars, uh, as well as some conversations that I've had with uh, people uh, in the FIDIC organization around the world. So here's some of the key findings. First of all, we are in uncharted territory and this calls for leadership at all levels. Uh, we need two-way, high-quality communication and flexibility to prepare for surprises and to seek win-win solutions to the many challenges we will face, recognizing that the best win-win under these circumstances could well be the least of the worst alternatives. The approach of in order for me to win, you have to lose, is in my view always very dangerous. I suggest that it's even more dangerous now. Second, we are learning to work very effectively remotely. To some degree, this has been going on well before the pandemic, but during it, we've experienced working remotely on steroids. In addition to helping us deal with personal issues, this, in my view, is creating an opportunity for engineering and construction professions to actually deliver projects faster, cheaper, safer, and at higher quality. This, in turn, could well help us move closer to meeting the American Society of Civil Engineers challenge of reducing the life cycle cost of infrastructure by 50%. Third, Working close within groups is dangerous and expensive due to distancing, protective equipment, monitoring, and training requirements. For example, in the United Kingdom, the construction industry estimates a 35% decline in productivity during the pandemic. This should be driving innovation and lead us to more effective ways of working. Perhaps we'll see even more use of robotics and drones in the future and perhaps even modular construction, which can be controlled, um, of, be conducted under more controlled conditions. And uh, the next slide, please. Fourth, there usually is a delay be before the full impact of any crisis is felt by engineering and construction firms. And we're seeing evidence of, this, of that during this particular emergency of the pandemic. Many, if not most firms, are pretty much okay now, but are concerned about 2021 and 2022. As an example, in April, the Raftelis firm reportedly projected an almost $33 billion negative economic impact to the United States water utilities and those that provide services to them, as well as the potential loss of 75,000 to 90,000 jobs. Hopefully, the government will help reduce this impact. Fifth, prior to the pandemic, the global community's investment in sustainable and resilient infrastructure, including water, was deficient. One estimate um, is that the need 
to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number six for water and wastewater. It's about $1.7 trillion over 15 years. I think the number is probably low considering the global urbanization trend, climate change, and sustainable development requirements. However, even as with that number and a, as a very large number, it is small when compared to the global uh, gross domestic product, and it's substantially less than what the world wastes or throws away on corruption every year. Sixth, and the final point, is the infrastructure challenges that we have will be exacerbated by budget shortfalls and the anticipated need for more medical facilities. We're seeing evidence of that by some international funding institutions already transferring funds from planned transportation and water projects to critically needed medical facilities. And then the next and final slide, I'll get on the soapbox for about 30 seconds or so, so where does this all leave the engineering profession? Engineers functioning as trusted advisors to decision makers can use their innovative skills to encourage more investment in infrastructure. We can reduce costs. We can further develop holistic approaches um, to our challenges like the one water concept. We can help reduce or eliminate corruption. We all should be screaming about that problem, which is insidious. We, we as engineers can develop innovative approaches for more effective project delivery. And finally, encourage our best and brightest to pursue STEM careers. The challenges are immense, but so is the potential for satisfaction for those who help the world solve them. If we do all of this right, I believe we'll help our fellow global citizens improve their quality of life, as well as help us all recover from this challenging crisis we're all in. Thank you and back to you, Heather. Bill, thank you. It was very interesting hearing about the COVID response internationally. Um, I must admit, I focus much more on the US because that's what's in the news, but global yep. perspective and the role of the engineer in this response equation is very important. Um, now, I have, now I have the pleasure of introducing Brian Sullivan. Brian is also a proud civil engineering alumnus and a member of the uh, Industrial Advisory Board. He has worked at, in the consulting business as a professional for over 35 years, currently serving as the president of Tetra Tech Infrastructure. Brian is very active professionally in societies such as ACEC, Society of Military Engineers, NIA, and ASCE. Brian is here today to offer his firsthand knowledge of the COVID building and infrastructure reopening impacts on his business and his clients' businesses. Brian? Thanks very much, Heather. Um, appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, I feel bad, though, because I'm one of the few people I think who is not one of the uh, outstanding civil uh, engineering <laughs> alumni. Have to talk to Jerry about that, uh, think about that a little bit. So I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to take it to uh, Bill talked very much about um, a macro level. I'm going to really drill it down to a micro level. Um, I, I'm responsible for a bunch of people at, at Tetra Tech and seven different office spaces. And I, my topic today is about the impact of COVID 19 on the workplace environment. Uh, next, next slide, Dave. Um, so we have a new environment. Uh, we're obviously living in a, in a different world. The pandemic has caused us to totally rethink how we use our offices. Uh, many of our offices have been, have been vacant, are close to vacant for several, several months. We're now trying to figure out how to get people, some people at least, back into our offices in a safe environment. Um, and it's caused us to rethink totally how we use the space. And it's created a work environment um, that's really, uh, unfortunately, although usable and hopefully safe, not very inviting. He's broken it down into five categories, building improvements, you know, making changes to the physical space, social distancing, we're all used to that. Personal protective equipment, uh, again, we're used to that, but not so much in an office environment. It's one thing to go into a building uh, shopping for, for you know, a few minutes. It's another thing to sit in a building for hours and, 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 um, and figure out how to keep people apart um, while still collaborating. Uh, personal office hygiene, you know, the old saying in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. Well, now in an office environment, it's all about clean, clean, clean. That's the, kind of the key word. How do you keep uh, the place clean? 
and then health screening. We need to make sure that our people are, if they're not feeling well or been exposed to, uh, to, to COVID, that they are staying home. So next, next slide. So building improvements, this is, um, <clears throat> this is an important area. We spent a lot of time rethinking this. Um, how do we make the building as safe as possible? What do you do to a, a basic office building um, that to, to make that? Um, obviously, uh, we've heard a lot about um, HVAC systems. We've upgraded all of our filters uh, in, in our HVAC units for better particulate removal. We've extended hours of operation, so we're getting more fresh air into the system. You're trying to uh, introduce um, outside air into the system, running for longer times in the morning and evening. Um, Heather mentioned uh, water systems. The building's been sitting stagnant for months and months and months. That water um, um, is the potential impacts of that are, are can be can be really negative. So we need to think about how to minimize that. Uh, this includes trying to flush the system, opening all faucets and drinking water, basic stuff, uh, replacing ice in the ice machines, flushing toilets, making sure that that water is moving and, and not becoming stagnant. Uh, bathrooms, obviously public bathrooms are a scary place now for most people, but um, and people are avoiding them. But if you're sitting in office for several hours at a time, you're probably gonna have to use a bathroom. So what do we do in bathrooms? Um, first is key is uh, ventilation, circulation. Uh, setting the fans at the highest operating speed, running them almost continuously. Um, doing things like um, touchless faucets and soap dispensers, foot pulls on the doors, automatic coated flush valves and, and full seat toilet seat covers. And you know, that sounds funny or maybe, or maybe you know, kind of basic, but many office buildings don't have these things or didn't prior to this and they, and they will now. Um, installing touchless wall mounted hand sanitizer dispensers everywhere in, in an office. Um, you didn't see that before. And things like touchless hand soap dispensers added at all bathrooms and kitchen sinks. Um, these, are, these are kind of the key things that we're doing in all of our offices, office spaces. Next slide. Dave. Um, so, social distance, that's, um, that's pretty standard operating procedure now but it's hard to do in an office where the environment is people want to collaborate, people, people want to meet and talk. So how do you have them in the office? So well, we're continuing um, to have them try to use venues like this, like Zoom or Microsoft Teams to try to um, minimize that. Um, we have conference rooms and we're limiting the capacity in those. We don't want a bunch of people in there. So an off a conference room that might uh, normally seat eight or 10, we're down to three or four people that can use that. Um, we're trying to, um, um, in, in our remote work, we do a lot of field work. We have some remote meetings. We're trying to do that as uh, only essential. We're trying to minimize that uh, to the extent possible and using uh, remote communication tools when possible. Uh, in our buildings that we have elevators, we're trying to limit uh, the elevator usage for one person at a time, if not uh, wearing face masks um, when, when, when you're in an office. Um, getting back to the uh, not very inviting um, spaces that we're creating, unfortunately, uh, we're, we're no longer having use of refrigerators, dishwashers, and vending machines. Uh, we don't want people using those. We're trying to uh, eliminate touch points. And we're not allowing any visitors uh, into, into our offices uh, for the time being. Next slide, Dave. Uh, okay, thank you. Personal protective equipment. Uh, obviously, everyone is used to wearing face masks. Um, and using hand sanitizer, again, it's one thing to do that uh, for periodically. It's another thing to do it uh, for several hours at a time. I feel bad for people who work in businesses where you have to wear a mask eight hours a day. That's, that's difficult, I'm sure. So we've decided that if you're sitting in your office or your cubicle, you don't need to have your mask on. But the minute you step outside that and work, work around the office, you know, go up to a coffee or, or use a bathroom or a kitchen, um, then you have to have your, your face mask on when another employee visits you. Um, Gloves, gloves are, are really, we're only requiring gloves when people are doing field work. We're not really requiring gloves in an office setting. Um, and when people are using gloves in the, in the field, we're making sure that they are properly disposed of. And then I mentioned before hand sanitizer. Um, we have it everywhere. We've, we've installed um, wall mounting units everywhere. Um, we're encouraging the use of that in hand washing um, with soap uh, when possible. And we're also providing a small bottle of um, hand sanitizer for, for every employee to keep at their desk to make sure they have that. Next slide. Um, personal and office hygiene. Obviously, um, we're, we're doing things like making sure that uh, we're posting signs and, and, and posters everywhere, reminding people to, 
to wash their hands, to sanitize their hands. Uh, we've also created a, 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 high, a high touch surface cleaning checklist. If you can go to the next slide, Dave. So you'll see this. Next slide, Dave. Thank you. Uh, you'll see this, uh, sometimes you'll see this, like if you're going to a restaurant at McDonald's, you'll see these, these I'm not sure how, how much they're actually used, I've done, how, how reliable they are. But we collaborated and we put together a, a list of all the touch points that people would, would touch that, you know, more than one person. And we basically have those, those surfaces cleaned and disinfected four times a day. Uh, and we actually uh, document that, and this is signed off on at the, at the end of every day, and it's recorded. Um, so we're making sure that we're, we're following that. Next slide. And then last but not least, uh, mandatory health screening. Uh, we don't want people coming into the office um, if they're not feeling well or they've potentially been exposed to COVID. So we've created a health screening app. You can see the QR code there on the right. Um, so someone can access this or people can access this off of their cell phone. And it asks you four basic questions. Um, do you have any symptoms, health symptoms? Are you caring for someone who has symptoms? Um, have you um, have you come into contact with someone who is who is tested positive, potentially te tested positive for COVID-19? And of course, have you tested positive for COVID-19? And if you answer yes to any of those questions, you must stay home. And this is done um, through, a, through a tracking system that we have. If you answer no to all four questions, then you are cleared to come into the office, but only for that day. This is something that people must do every single day. Um, and it's our way to try to make sure that uh, we're not introducing anything, any health issues into an office we're trying to keep people healthy and safe. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I'll turn it back over to you, Heather. I just want to say um, that, you know, it's a logistical challenging time for everybody. And certainly how, to, how do we get people back into our offices safely and health, healthily is one of our key, if not the key thing that we need to do for, for our staff and our people. So thanks, Heather. Hand it back over to you. Brian, thank you so much. I was very surprised to, to think about all the myriad of things as we try to reopen buildings, allowing staff and customers back in, the details, the financial impacts, and all the solutions are all sort of tangled together and clearly take a lot of patience to work through. So what, what, One thing, Heather, I said it was challenging to, to get people out of the building. That pales in comparison to how challenging it is to get people back into buildings. <laughs> Amazingly difficult to do that. I am sure that is totally true. I can feel that myself. Yeah, thank you. So now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Kelsey Piper. Uh, Dr. Piper has degrees in civil and mechanical engineering and a doctorate in biological systems engineering. Dr. Piper is relatively new to Northeastern, but comes in with a wealth of information to share with us today. She's leading an effort to test water quality and stagnant and reduced water use buildings. She's collaborating on the topic of scientific merits and the justification behind current reopening protocols. And lastly, is researching corrosion of scale, corrosion scale stability when the drinking water supply is disrupted. I think we would all agree these are very timely topics. Dr. Piper. Thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Kelsey Piper. Um, I'm gonna be presenting on drinking water research. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Thank you, Davis. So this research is a large collaborative effort that involves multiple universities and organizations and is being uh, sponsored by the American Water Works Association as well as the National Science Foundation. Next slide. So our first effort was to think about what happens to drinking water quality in a large building when work from home advisories were put in place. And this is a paper that we just put out. It's publicly available if you'd like to download it. Um, and so what happens is during normal water use patterns, fresh water is being constantly replenished throughout the system. It's bringing in disinfectant residual, corrosion control, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, which is leading to a stable environment for biofilms, corrosion scales, and microbial activity. But with uh, COVID stay-at-home orders, work shifted from commercial buildings to residential buildings, leading to a reduction or even no water use in these buildings which led to a reduction or even a depletion of the disinfection residuals and corrosion control because there was no more fresh water being supplied throughout the system. And as a result, this has changed 
the microbial activity, the scale stability, and the biofilms within our drinking water network. Next slide. One of the most important conversations that's being had right now on the national scale and even international is the impact of the depletion of chlorine or of disinfectant residuals, either chlorine or chloramine, because this can lead to increased pathogen growth. And of particular concern is Legionella, which causes Legionnaire's disease or severe pneumonia. And one of the things that we look at is what are the risk factors associated with the two types of residuals and what are the potential water quality issues in these different types of systems? And then lastly, what we, what we look at is thinking about what guidances are being recommended by public health agencies. So we reviewed a handful of the main ones and found that there are basically three main uh, recommendations that are being told to building, uh, building managers. The first is to not allow stagnation. So to practice routine flushing to constantly bring the flush water into the system. To, to implement remedial flushing if your building has gone under stagnation to do this right before occupancy resumes. And then if there's any microbial concerns to disinfect the system. Next slide. Problem is there's not a lot of information on this because it's, there hasn't been a lot of knowledge about prolonged stagnation. And that's where our team at Northeastern applied to the National Science Foundation to receive a rapid grant, looking at how not only reduced water use in commercial buildings, but also increased water use in residential buildings are going to impact biofilm and scale in our scale layers. Next slide. And so this research has started up in the beginning of June with uh, Dr. Amit Pinto's graduate students starting sampling. And you can follow our up, follow updates at Boston Tap. And one of the most exciting uh, findings so far is that they found no Legionella in the six taps that they sampled in large buildings. And this was on a chlor uh, chloramine system. So that was really exciting and really important because that is a national concern. But what they're doing is, next slide, looking at other different parameters. Next slide, thank you. Um, looking at other different parameters, such as shown here as temperature. And so this is two different taps in the same building. And as flushing is occurring, you're seeing that one tap is seeing a decrease in temperature, while the other is seeing an increase in temperature. And so this is really important because it's getting to the point that building plumbing systems are complicated. And they are not as straightforward as our residential systems where we spent most of our time thinking about as a drinking water industry. And so this comes to the point that a uh, one size fits all flushing recommendation is not going to be advisable because it's not going to be appropriate for every single type of large building out there. Next slide. And so that's where our team has been working on right now. We are coming out with a draft of a flushing manual produced by the American Water Works Association. If you'd like to be put on the list for the distribution, it's going to be, uh, please email Dr. William Rhodes. It's supposed to be coming out at the end of the month. And this is looking at how do we work with building managers to develop a response that is appropriate for their building? Next slide. So one of the things in this manual is starting to customize their response. So looking at factors like, do they have a water management plan? What type of contaminants are they concerned about? How long has their system been stagnant? And so by answering some of these questions, we can work with building managers to decide what is gonna be the best course of action to make sure they can reopen their system safely. Next slide. And then in addition to that, not only are we trying to help them customize their plan, but we're also giving them step by steps on how to implement these different response actions. So shown here is a flushing diagram and it walks through if you're trying to flush out your system, starting at the point of entry all the way to your distal taps, what do you have to consider? How do you go about doing this? Thinking about your risers, thinking about any special equipment you have, or any mechanical equipment. And so the whole point of this is, you know, we have a lot of need, we have a lot of need to reopen these buildings, but we also need to make sure that we're doing it appropriately and correctly. And so we're working with the building managers to get these policies in place. Next slide. And so just kind of in closing where we're going next, what COVID has really shown is that there are some big gaps in our knowledge of drinking water research. And two in particular are, we have a lot of understanding about small residential buildings or simple plumbing networks, and these building systems are complicated and they're complex and we need to have better understanding and better customization of our protocols. And then also 
stagnation has been something we've thought about in the short term, from hours to days, not weeks to months to even years. And so we need to have better understanding of these to better, have better public health policies. And so what our collaborative team is working on next is we are an interdisciplinary team sampling uh, buildings all throughout the United States and Canada to try to understand what building factors as well as water quality factors are going to increase the risk of different water quality contamination issues. And so with that, uh, thank you, Heather. I'll send it back to you. Okay, Dr. Piper, thank you so much. Your presentation was a great follow on to Mr. Sullivan's as we now think about reopening work areas. Both the physical and the laboratory aspects of COVID monitoring are important to us as engineers and society at large. Our final speaker today is Dr. Amit Pinto. Dr. Pinto has degrees in chemical and environmental engineering, including a PhD in civil engineering. Dr. Pinto is an expert in the topic of wastewater-based epidemiology. Although wastewater impacts have been his passion for quite a while, this area is currently very crucial to understanding the environmental impacts of COVID in our wastewater. Dr. Pinto is working with a global team to study both the spread of the extent of COVID as well as what it means to have viruses in our wastewater and the lack of treatment prior to discharge into our waterways. Dr. Pinto? Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, all right. David, can you put on my slides? Thank you, Heather, for the kind introduction. Um, and I'll just, um, um, what I'm going to talk, talk today about is uh, signals and sewage. As uh, Heather said, I, uh, um, I work in the area of wastewater and drinking water. Uh, Wastewater-based epi epidemiology has shown up uh, on everybody's radar over the last few months because suddenly uh, um, the value that it provides to our society, the value that it provides to public health and our economy has been put in the spotlight uh, by this current pandemic that we are going through. So what I'll be talking today is signals in the sewage. I am, uh, while I work in this particular area, I'm by no means uh, 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 sort of a leader in this field. There are many fantastic groups across the world and in the United States who are doing amazing work in this uh, particular area. So uh, David, could I get the next slide, please? So uh, what is wastewater-based epidemiology and how is it being used? So essentially what's happening around the world um, and even in the United States is that we're looking for signals of the SARS-CoV-2, the SARS, uh, sort of the novel coronavirus in sewage. And we are using that information to give us a sense of what is the community level prevalence of this particular virus. Now, the reason this is important is we know that uh, a lot of transmission is driven by asymptomatic individuals, people who, who are infected, but still do not have any symptoms or they're either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and they are able to transmit it to the next individual. And so while wastewater might, might not help us pin it down to or identify individuals who are, uh, who are infected, it can give us some uh, reasonable information about how prevalent uh, or how prevalent um, uh, COVID-19 is in the community that we are sampling for, uh, from. So this typically involves collection of sewage and then we are looking for the genetic material of this virus, which is an RNA virus. So we have to extract um, the RNA from the sample and put it through a process that we call reverse transcription quantitative PCR to detect uh, this virus in sewage. Next slide, please. Now, wastewater-based epidemiology is not a new concept. It's been around for ages. So for example, um, one of the uh, fantastic examples of using wastewater-based epidemiology has been to look at prevalence of polio viruses, again, um, in sewage to try to understand whether polio virus is circulating within the community or whether it has been eradicated. This is particularly useful in parts of the world where the infrastructure for clinical testing uh, is, is lacking. Uh, so you can, you can monitor the sewage, try to understand whether, you, you know, whether polio virus is prevalent in, in any given community. But that's just one angle. Wastewater-based epidemiology is also used for lots of different, uh, can also be used for lots of different aspects, such as looking, uh, looking at um, sort of uh, drug use patterns within communities, illicit and illicit drugs, 
And so th there has been lots of work that's been done in it. The type of expertise you require to investigate any particular analyte in a wastewater matrix varies on a broad scale from microbiology to pretty, uh, pretty intensive uh, uh, analytical chemistry methods. But the basic concept remains the same, is, is that you're sampling an entire pool, uh, uh, pool of individuals via the wastewater. Next slide, please. So this is one of the reasons um, there is a renewed interest in um, sort of wastewater-based epidemiology. Um, you know, people have been doing it for a while, but um, uh, the, the challenge with asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic pre transmission is why we are now uh, uh, see this as uh, incredible value. And so it's getting a lot of attention. You've probably seen articles in the New York Times. So here is, um, you know, with headlines like what you flush is helping keep uh, helping track the coronavirus. Another another headline that says, "Is it is it safe to come out of lockdown? Ch uh, check the sewers." And so it's um, there are uh, national level programs established in several countries in Europe, I believe, in the Netherlands, um, uh, in Finland, um, and in the United States. There is also a national effort being driven by the uh, by Water Research Foundation and several other research groups. Next slide, please. And the reason we are able to do this is even though uh, we tend to think about COVID-19 as a primarily respiratory disease, uh, this particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, can infect a range of different uh, uh, tissues and organs in our body. And it can also be released through stool. So this is, this is some data from a paper published earlier this year that shows the viral load in the left panel uh, is the viral load that is copies of its genome per milliliter of uh, uh, sample. Uh, and what you can see is that in stool, you still get reasonable amount of viral load um, uh, compared to respiratory samples. So it's, and that's extremely, extremely useful. If you were not, if this virus was not being shed through the stool, then sewage monitoring would not be uh, useful. What we also see is that the signal can be prolonged. On the right panel, what you're seeing is that, uh, the signal in the stool, the number of uh, copies of virus that are shed in the stool after days, certain days of onset is, is, uh, is not short, right? It's on par with uh, finding a signal in the respiratory uh, swab sample. So it's quite useful in terms of trying to track, um, uh, um, uh, track this virus at a community level. At the same time, uh, not everybody sheds through stool. So I think there are some statistics, I believe, um, I, I don't remember them right now, maybe about 30 to 50% or 40% of infected individuals uh, might not shed through the stool. I, um, so, um, you know, this is, this is still a very, very quickly evolving field. And what this has helped, helped us to do, uh, and I'm gonna present data, uh, David, next slide, please. I'm gonna present data that came out in a very nice preprint uh, that came out of Eric Arms group in, um, uh, at MIT, and this is particularly relevant for us because this is this is in Boston. This is where they sampled uh, through with this uh, for a really long period of time. They've been sampling sewage, and uh, what you see on the top panel uh, with the blue and yellow uh, lines is that uh, the blue line shows the viral titers that were measured in sewage, and the yellow line shows uh, the daily confirmed cases in the region that kind of um, sends its wastewater to the Deer Island wastewater treatment plant for treatment. What you can see from that plot really nicely is the fact that the viral titers in sewage track the number of daily confirmed cases quite well. What's also quite interesting is in the bottom panel, what you're seeing is the rates of hospitalizations. There is now another study that has come out of Yale uh, over the last month or so, which suggests that the hospitalizations that you might see lags uh, the viral signal in sewage. So there is real value over here uh, to get a sense of community level prevalence and also to prepare uh, for what its impact might be on our healthcare system. Next slide, please. Um, so wastewater-based surveillance is going to help um, um, uh, policy decisions, whether that's uh, informing stay-at-home advisories, whether it's informing transition from one phase to another. Um, but What's also quite important over here is that when these decisions are made based on measurements taken in sewage, um, that community, the public in whose interest these decisions are made are comfortable with it. 
So this is a nice paper that came out uh, in a journal Water Research recently, which talked about wastewater-based surveillance of SARS-CoV-2. And it ends this, and I'm highlighting two sections of this, is ends the paper by saying that wastewater surveillance must be developed to address both privacy and inequality concerns. Because there are, you know, we can think about the fact that if you're beginning to take community level signals, community, community level monitoring, you know, that there are, there are amazing uses of it and there are uses of it that might not be uh, appropriate, for instance. So for example, if, um, if surveillance, wastewater-based surveillance is not used with support of the community, it might lose public legitimacy and trust in these measures. And we might lose out in a very, very important tool that's gonna to be helpful for public good, not just during the pandemic, but even after. Next slide, please. And this, uh, you know, this now is a paper from a couple of years ago. These are a range of different applications that you can actually apply wastewater-based surveillance for. Looking for industrial chemical markers, looking for food and diet marker, for instance, looking for other disease burdens within the community. And all of this data can be put to immense good use as long as wastewater-based epidemiology is built and is implemented uh, with uh, a public buy-in and public trust. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll send it back to you, Heather. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Pinto. Uh, as you pointed out, wastewater may not be the most glamorous topic for much in the community at large, but as you've demonstrated, it's vitally important and very interesting to the civil engineering profession. I look forward to hearing further on the topic. Um, so now we've concluded the four presentations and I'm gonna ask the first question. So Mr. Sullivan and Dr. Piper focused their remarks on the impact of water in stagnant buildings. And I assume that there are also impacts to stagnant and reduced use buildings from wastewater. Um, are most of these impacts at the treatment plant level or are they at the office building level? So that maybe this is more of a municipal issue. And I was also curious whether you've done any exploration about buildings with septic systems or local onsite treatment of wastewater. I um, was just hoping for maybe an expansion of this a bit. So go ahead. Yeah, um, the buildings that, 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 that we're in, you know, most commercial office buildings don't tend to be on a septic system, although I guess some could be. Um, so we're in a public, you know, we're on public um, water and, and, and sanitary uh, collection systems. So we haven't given a whole lot of thought to the sanitary aspect of it, although I heard a little bit about uh, what Dr. Pinter had said before in, the, in his presentation, I thought was really interesting. Um, and he got me thinking, uh, thinking a bit about that. Um, so that's something that we need to think a bit about more, you know, when it comes to wastewater, we're just trying to make sure that people feel comfortable actually going into our bathrooms. Uh, that's kind of a, our overriding uh, issue right now, because as I mentioned, people are scared about ba public bathrooms right now. Um, and, you know, we're just, we're just trying to keep, keep those as safe, as healthy as possible. And we are concerned, as I mentioned, about the, wa the water impacts, you know, making sure that water is not stagnant and, and people are, 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 are feel safe, but safe and comfortable with that as well. Okay. Dr. Dr. Piper, do you have anything to add on that? No, we have to, we haven't, I'm going to default to Dr. Pinto on that because we have been looking more at the water side. No, I think I, I think um, and, and that, that was perfectly perfectly fine. I think um, there is a lot of um, a lot of discussion around. So, for example, you know, um, colleges are going to open very soon <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. for in-person classes, and I know there are uh, some very very competent research groups across the country that are trying to use sewage-based monitoring to try to understand prevalence on campus, um, uh, and so that is that is an incredibly uh, powerful tool. This is, um, and so um, whether, I don't know if someone's taken this beyond municipal systems into decentralized smaller systems, but this is something certainly to look into. Okay. All right. So at this time, I'm going to turn the microphone back to Dr. Hagar. Dr. Hagar has been monitoring for chat questions and we'll ask and see if there's any chat questions for now. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for your great presentations. And uh, we are getting some questions in. So the first one uh, is to Amit Pinto, which would be how are government agencies uh, implementing these trace methodologies? What's, 
what's a what's a, a an approach for doing that here um so i think um I'm aware of some examples in Europe where this is being done through partnerships with research institutes. Uh, and these might be government run research institutes. Um, uh, some, uh, some agencies also have um, uh, uh, sentinel systems or dashboards where you can actually uh, take a look at, uh, get data in real time. So for example, I'll, uh, MWRA, the Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant just recently started sharing sewage monitoring data and you can go take a look you can see what the trends are uh, of SARS-CoV-2 and you can see a really really strong peak when we were going through a surge back in March and April and uh, also a nice long plateau now which gives a lot of confidence in in how um, the people in the Boston area are managing and dealing with this dealing with this pandemic so I think the models are not uniform uh, they are very different uh, depending on where you are. So for example, I believe MWRA is, is uh, do, uh, running this effort on their own via a company that provides them the service of um, uh, analyzing those samples. So I don't think there is one, a single answer to that, to that question. I think it, it matters where you are and um, yeah. All right, very good. And uh, question to Kelsey Piper. Um, are there issues with lead, lead levels uh, in the water? And uh, what have we learned from Flint, Michigan, relative to what might be going on here? Is there anything that that relates? So, one of the big questions we have with the protocols right now is there's not been a lot of guidance on testing. Um, most of the focus with the reopening has been on the microbial side. We have had a lot of discussions on the lead and copper side because of thinking of schools and daycares that are starting to reopen because they are the highest risk uh, population. Um, one of the things, especially in the context of Flint, that we've learned is just how, where the regulations, what are the bounds of the regulations? So the lead and copper rule, which would be for lead testing, is not necessarily going to pick up these buildings. They have to meet their certain requirements. And so testing is going to be up to the discretion of the building owner. There's nothing, there's no regulations right now. Anybody also, else? Maybe, worth, maybe worth noting that the lead is not in the water. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the systems themselves. I don't know, yeah. many people might not, might not realize that. It's not in the water, it's not coming from the water, it's coming from the delivery system, yeah. the pipes and, and things like that. That's, that's where the issue of lead and, lead and water is. Yeah. I think also it's, yeah. it's, it's, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Piper? Oh, I was just gonna come in saying, yes, yeah, the lead from the water leaving the water treatment plant typically is clear, free of lead. It's when you get onto the property, where you have brass, solder joints, lead service lines is where the lead is being introduced. With these shutdowns, there's kind of two realms that we're thinking about, the lead dissolving from the pipes and increasing in levels. And then also your water utility will introduce corrosion control to precipitate the lead out onto scales. And we don't know what's gonna happen to those scales when there's no more corrosion control being con replenished in the system. So that's we're looking at dissolved and particulate issues with this. I think there is, um, you know, so this is certainly the changes in chemistry that might come from the extended stagnation periods is like desperate need of investigation, desperate need of attention. I think what I also want to kind of distinguish because this question was put in the context of lessons learned from Flint, Michigan. Flint was a very, very different situation where the change in chemistry of the water started at the source water and decisions were made not to use corrosion control. So that was a drastic change that happened that destabilized lots of different aspects of the distribution system. This might be a little bit more nuanced and different, uh, actually a lot different than that particular situation, but these issues of lead and corrosion are still quite important. All right, thank you. We have a couple of questions uh, about uh, air uh, systems in buildings. I'm not sure if any of the panelists um, are able to answer these. One relates to HVAC filters and uh, whether anyone has information on, on whether they should be changed more frequently. Um, and uh, then there's a, a question about the fact that um, many buildings don't have um, proper air, good air distribution systems or HVAC systems, is there any way to know whether it's uh, acceptable to open those? Anybody want to give that a try? I'll, I'll, I'll comment since I haven't, I haven't thinking about this. Um, 
Yeah, the, the question about um, changing air filters, that's a good one that, you know, if you, if you again, I, I, I have a control of seven different buildings and every building is different, different ownership, different landlords. They all have kind of different protocols. There's no standard protocol for changing air filters. I would say normally in an office building, they're changed maybe once a year. Um, we, are, we are encouraging and we're actually offering to pay um, to, to um, increase the frequency of that. We want higher level filters and we want increased frequency to at least um, twice a year. And, and in some cases, depending on how many people in the building to uh, quarterly, I'm trying to get, and they're not expensive. The air filters are not, are not expensive. So it's, it's, it seems to be the prudent, the prudent thing to do for changing them. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of how do we know uh, the air, air quality in a building is safe? That's a great question. I, I don't think anyone that I'm aware of is monitoring air quality in a building. Um, we're just trying to do things to make it to make the system better and operate um, more efficiently, uh, get better particulate removal, introduce more fresh air into the system. We're also encouraging people where we wouldn't before in an office building that you can actually open a window. Most you can't, but some you can. In the nice weather, um, you wouldn't normally do that because it messes up the balance of the system. We're having people open windows and getting fresh air into the into the building as much as possible. Anybody else like to comment on that? Okay, um, there's a question here about whether anybody has seen any information about uh, potentially the large increase in uh, disinfectants, uh, discarding of gloves and masks and so on, and its possible impact on the environment. And have we seen any studies coming out on this yet about whether this is something that needs to be addressed or are we in the noise? That's a really great question. I have not seen, I have seen some discussions about the potential impact on, for example, uh, sewage systems or wastewater treatment plants. But my impression is it's probably not that significant or at least at least that we know of. Um, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, so these are these knock-on effects that uh, we don't think about. I remember when we were down uh, sampling drinking water in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, people were talking about plastic wastes. Uh, because of all the bottled water that was being used. Uh, and so certainly, uh, I think, Bill, do you uh, have something to share? Well, what, <clears throat> when I see the, um, the comment about plastics, I think back of, uh, of what I hear in FIDIC from people from all over the world. And it's, it's a huge, huge problem in a, in a whole variety of ways. So um, <clears throat> I would expect this adds to a problem that's already a massive problem, and it's probably the subject um, uh, of a separate webinar, what happens to plastic uh, uh, all over the world, how it breaks down, and where it's causing damages, and that sort of thing. And I vaguely remember, just to put some of this global stuff into perspective, that if we dealt with plastics properly in, in North America, we, we would only put a, mi a relatively minor dent in the global plastic problem, to pull a percentage out of the air, maybe 10 or 20% or something like that, um, it just indicates the, the magnitude of this problem. And it's, it starts with the plastic being disposed, but then as it breaks down, it causes worse and worse problems. And I'm getting into an area now that I am not qualified to talk about, particularly to a lot of uh, doctors and professors, but it's a massive problem and I think it's, going to make matters worse. Um, the other thing I'd say, well, I, while I'm a little bit on the soapbox, is the lead problem, to come back to it, I think there's an opportunity here for everyone to be talking to governmental decision makers about programs to get us out of this pandemic. Infrastructure has historically been a, a strategy to move people out. Um, of, of the impact of a pandemic, and maybe uh, some states might be bold enough to mandate that all lead services will be removed within you know, five years, 10 years or something. This is a perfect time to be screaming about that. So that's great. I'll put the soapbox away, sorry. Bill, while, uh, while we have you, have you seen any international efforts through FIDIC, for example, to try to get the word out on, on the types of issues that that uh, Kelsey Piper was speaking about. 
Um, not at that level, but it's certainly um, something that we have a board meeting coming up, and, I, and I'm going to, uh, to ask that very question. Um, I would imagine people are talking about this in their own circles everywhere, but I have not heard anything at, in, in FIDIC about, about that uh, particularly, uh, particular problem. Uh, I suspect that there's a lot of buildings that got opened up pretty unsafely or that might. Uh, around the world, because I have not heard really a thing about it. I'd, I'd almost ask the question back to the professors, how much interaction and have they heard uh, from other universities uh, around the, around the, uh, the world? Dr. Piper? We have just, uh, we've done a little bit of lit review outside of the u.s but most of our work has just focused on canada and the u.s right now right. but i think that's a great point well if you'd like some contacts i can try to get them it's a great yeah, absolutely it, more and more dialogue around the world about all these issues is absolutely critical i think so maybe send me an, an email to remind me my short-term memory is a <laughs> challenge so uh, next question is, what is the detection limit for measuring COVID RNA? Uh, and for example, are the measured values from a, a dorm building um, substantially above this detection limit? Okay, um, so the detection limit is going to vary depending on the method that you use. Uh, um, I, think, I think more importantly than the specific detection limit, is the sec you know in the more relevant question is the second one can we measure from a dorm building uh, you know for instance there are a lot of uncertainties associated with it as you go closer and closer to the source um, you know um, uncertainties from how many people are in the dorm building to how many people use the toilet that day in the dorm building uh, to how many people um, uh, for instance were you sampling at the right time so you know you can address the issue of sampling through composite sampling. Um, but I think I have seen estimates that if you have one person who is infected and actively shedding, uh, the likelihood of detecting that through, for example, composite sampling might be somewhere between 20 to 40 percent uh, likelihood of detecting that. So clearly, as more number of people start shedding, you start detecting it. Um, uh, and, uh, but that is um, clearly an open research question. And just as a follow-up, you know, we've seen in Massachusetts uh, uh, a modest uptick uh, that yeah. we're concerned. If you uh, do testing out at the Boston Wastewater Treatment Plant, are, are you doing enough testing to have predicted this a week ahead of time or so, or seeing those trends? And, and are you able to help directly use this to steer us in the right direction? So this is, yeah. So I, so there are research groups who are monitoring the Boston wastewater treatment plant and they are, their feedback does, I believe, feed into um, some of the decisions that are made. That uptick fortunately went down again, so which is nice uh, in, 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 in sewage. We, this is a project that we are beginning to, uh, we are uh, going to work with with the city of Somerville over the next, next, next few months. So I think we'll have a much better sense of how for example, those wastewater-based measurements feed into decision-making at the, at the city level at that point. Great, thank you. Well, we are at one o'clock, uh, and so I think we will want to wrap up there. Uh, I would like to thank our moderator, Heather Ford, and all of our speakers uh, for their excellent uh, job in preparing and for the presentations. I'd like to thank the audience, certainly, for your participation, for the great questions. And I know these are, these are challenging times, but I always get heartened uh, when I see the hard work of the civil and environmental engineering community to study these issues, to start to develop solutions. Uh, and in closing, thank you all for joining today. I'd like to especially thank all of our alumni and our students who are out there uh, who have joined. Our department is certainly going to be um, remaining active nationally and internationally as leaders on addressing these issues related to the pandemic and on civil and environmental engineering uh, challenges and opportunities in general. So please keep an eye out for our seminars that we offer periodically to the public as the academic year kicks in here. 
Uh, thanks again, everybody, and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.